Almost forgot my gloves. God be with you this morning on this, the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. Glad you are all well and uh, able to be here with us this morning. With that, let us go ahead and begin with our hymn of invocation, hymn number 863, Our Father by Whose Name.
Hear now this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes to pass, that it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
crucified on the soul of Christ and the conscious power. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again in glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the Lord of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is called by the cross. And I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism in the Lord.
name of Jesus, amen. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Thus far the word of the Lord, please be seated. So, half a year ago, we gathered here before uh, the pandemic, before the riots and the social unrest and the tearing down of statues, and now the discussion of whether, by force, Christian art should be removed from Christian churches. So a half a year ago, we gathered in this place not knowing what was going to be before us, and we sang hymns of praise to the Prince of Peace. The title for our Lord and Savior, given by the prophet Isaiah, and all our signs and ornaments hanging on our trees, both here and at home, have that word, peace. Peace on earth. Good will toward men. So the whole host of heaven proclaims on that holy night when our Lord is born, peace on earth. For the Prince of Peace has come. Now, God doesn't do things the way we do them. And he doesn't often mean things the way we think he does. Very clearly, here our Lord tells us, and we're seeing it, what this Prince of Peace will cause upon the earth. The earth remains at enmity with the Prince of Peace. It remains the kingdom of the evil one. Even though he's defeated, remember, we celebrate this in September when we celebrate St. Michael's and all angels. We hear about how Satan is cast down here and he's filled with great wrath. Why? Because that spoiled little brat knows That he's already lost the game and doesn't want anybody else to win. Doesn't want you to win. He doesn't want you to take part in that peace. He doesn't want you to take part in that life. He hates the Lord. And because you bear his name by virtue of your baptism, he hates you. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. A sword, as Simeon would proclaim as he held that baby, the Prince of Peace, in his arms, and that baby was just a couple of months old, presented in the temple, God returning to his temple in the flesh, carried by his mother Mary, escorted by his stepfather, if you will, Joseph. God, the Creator, the second person of the Holy Trinity, Almighty God, Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, carried, necessarily so, by his mother, as an infant, into his temple that bore his name. And Simeon, whose song we will sing in just a short while, after we receive with our mouths that same Creator, that same Lord, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, Simeon will take this baby into his arms and say, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace. We can depart in peace. No matter how death comes to you, 
now, whether it's by violence, whether you are called to be a martyr, or whether you die in your bed, you die in peace. Because you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. You are an heir to everlasting life. You are forgiven all your sin by Christ, through Christ, in Christ. Washed clean by his blood. And so no matter what we experience, we will die in peace. And no matter how it happens, or when it happens, it is merely the completion of your baptism. At that moment, your baptism is now done. And your eyes will open before the Lord, the Lamb who was slain, the, makes, the Lamb who makes all this possible. But Simeon will go on as he holds this baby, and after we taste this baby, to look at Mary and Joseph and say, well, you know, a sword is going to pierce your soul too. He's going to be this one destined for the rise and fall of many, and a sword will pierce your soul too. That's what the Prince of Peace does. His word goes out through the mouths of the prophets, Jeremiah, through the apostles, St. Paul, and by the pastors who now teach in the one holy Catholic, Christian, apostolic church, who teach what has been handed to them. The word of Christ goes out and it cuts us. It tells us what we don't want to hear about ourselves. Shows us a picture of ourselves that we would rather not see. We are ushered into the attic, that locked room, and there the curtain is pulled aside, and there is our portrait of what we truly are. Dorian, staring us in the face. The ugliness of our sin. The ugliness of what we are. The ugliness of our hearts staring us in the face. This is what you are apart from me. Our Lord will show us. He will show us exactly how sick we are and how desperately we need a doctor. How desperately we need the great physician. And we who have been healed, we who have been given eternal life, we haven't just been cured of the symptoms, we have been cured of the disease. Death for us is simply sleep. Rest in peace. We will. Indeed we will. Because of Christ. We have been cured. Take heart. Your sins are forgiven. Everything comes with those words. Life. Salvation. Everything comes with those words. So out we go to our families, to our workplaces, as people who have been cured, and we find right away that the world is still at enmity. Starts with our dinner tables, where often the people we love the most want nothing to do with what we proclaim. Or as they grow and they begin to be influenced by the world, become openly hostile to what you stand for. And they may openly mock you, or you may openly mock them. Maybe had you had your moments of rebellion when you looked at your parents and said, who believes that kind of nonsense as the influence of your mighty professors and all their wisdom began to seep into your brain and you not being well educated enough to understand that maybe there's another side to that argument and maybe I should use some critical reasoning here, just bought it hook, line, and sinker until the spirit and time would chip that away and you would repent. You see, the Prince of Peace does come, and he comes to make peace with us and the Father. So we who were at enmity, we who were enemies of God, can now be heirs, children, grafted in. And we are called again and sent into the world with that same cross to bear to proclaim and live that good news, knowing that we have been cured of the disease. 
and we find, as I have said right away, that a father is indeed set against a child and vice versa. You have to fight with your kids to get them to come to Sunday school and you give up. You have to fight with your kids to get them to come to confirmation. It's boring. Too bad. A lot of life is boring. A lot of the boring stuff in life is important. A lot of the boring stuff in life is things that you will cling to and crave for when it's taken away from you. And God just might do that. A person's enemies will be those of his own household. And yet he reminds us, don't love your father or mother more than me. This doesn't say don't love your father or mother, but don't love them more than Jesus. That means when you love your father or mother or a mother and father loves their children, you have to speak the truth because you love Jesus and because you know Jesus loves them and wants them to be with you. It's hard. So what? Life in this world is hard. And it's only getting harder. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. This is what he does. He sends us into the world as his people and says, you're going to have to talk. You're going to have to hold up my peace, which is the cure. And you're going to have to cling to that. Whoever finds his life will lose it. If you go for the comfort of the world and not wanting to deal with those, and this doesn't mean every meal and every conversation has to be a battle. No, that's not what he's talking about. But you have to speak the truth when you are called to do so. And that's not every time, every moment. But when he calls you to do it, you will speak. You are Christ's. The Spirit lives within you. He lives within you. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That's the life of a Christian. Constantly being emptied of ourselves, sometimes forcefully. Sometimes without our consent and our desire. Very often without our consent and our desire. Thy will be done, please no. Yes. Thy will will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Yes, it will. So we find our life in Christ. But then this promise, as he sends us out, his apostles, his pastors, you, whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. And as we're received, as that word of Christ is received, those who receive it are blessed. Now think about that wonderful promise. We don't know how long it takes. That's not our job. We don't know what the Spirit does with the Word once we proclaim it and once we share it. That's not our job. We can't get past people's ears. We just pray that it would be received. That the plans of Satan would be thwarted, that our own sin would get out of the way, and that our ears would be open that the ears of those we love would be open, and that they would stand alongside us, receiving and proclaiming. And then once that happens, there, of course, is Satan saying, oh, you don't deserve any of this. No, of course we don't, but thanks be to God, he gives it to us anyway. And when Satan comes and says, but if the pastor or, or your family only knew what kind of sinner you actually were, they wouldn't have said those things to you. They wouldn't give you Christ nonsense. Christ knows who you are. Whoever receives you receives me. That's going to be echoed as he stands before his apostles on the Easter Sunday. And he says, okay, after he gives them the Holy Spirit, after he breathes on them as he did at creation, as he breathed on that dirt and life came, He says, if you forgive anyone their sins, they're forgiven. And if you don't, they're not forgiven. 
So when the pastor stands before you, as he did just a few minutes ago, and says, I forgive you, in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, of all the sins that maybe I don't know, but Christ knows, he most certainly does. You have no secrets from him. Everything you've done, you have done in secret is done in his light. He knows. And yet he says to you, as you receive that word, let it be done for you as you receive. I forgive you all your sins. You receive that word, you have received Christ. And you have received the one who sent him. As you go out then, forgiven, cured, and you go out and look at those people who have hurt you, those people you sit at the table with who keep letting you down, who keep openly displaying their enmity for what you confess and what you believe and who you are as a conservative. Well, you should be. Christian, who actually believes the words that are before us. That's you, that's me. As they receive that word, they have received him too. We're given the power of the word. Isn't that an amazing thing? With the full force of God behind it. The problem is we want to make it about this, we want to make it about that, about being heartily sorry, they're not sorry enough, whoever is. Or, they're not repentant enough, whoever is. Or, I don't feel it. That probably happens to you more than you'd like to admit. That there needs to be some sort of stirring and burning in your heart when those simple words, week after week, are spoken to you. No. That's a distraction of Satan and your own sin. Christ speaks. He speaks through the pastor. He speaks through you. And you receive. And you receive everything he speaks. Sometimes rebuke, yes. Sometimes that word of correction that says, Knock it off! Repent! And then how often that word of forgiveness in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ I forgive you all your sins indeed you are forgiven the one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive that reward the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward and whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. The reward is yours and yours to share. Amen. Now the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise as we sing the offertory. Once again, at this time, the offering would be received, but we'll collect it at the door today. And again, I continue to thank you for remembering the church in your tithes and offerings. And can, Lord, we pray that the Lord continue to bless us with uh, the gifts that we need to support his work in our community and in this place. We continue with the prayer of the church. 
Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near to the Lord's throne of grace and pray as he has commanded us, trusting in the Lord to hear the prayers of his people and to answer our petitions according to his mercy. O most merciful God, Lord of heaven and earth, we pray you so to rule and govern your church and all her pastors and ministers that she may be preserved in the pure doctrine of your saving word, defended against all adversity, and protected from all adversaries, that thereby faith may be strengthened and love increased in us. Grant health, wisdom, and integrity to all in authority over us, especially to the President of the United States, the Governor of this state, the Congress, all legislative bodies, and all judges and magistrates. Endow them with your spirit and with respect for your word, that they would serve your good pleasure for the maintenance of righteousness and the punishment of wickedness, so that we all may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. According to your gracious will, turn the hearts of our enemies and make them to walk with us in humility and peace. Grant to those in trouble, want, sickness, anguish of labor, peril of death, or any other adversity, the healthful spirit of your grace for healing, strength, comfort, and relief. Bless especially those who suffer for the sake of your name and your word. Hear us on behalf of Betty, Jack, Wayne, who is a, a, a friend of this congregation, but not a member of this congregation, for Dorothy, for all who are crying out to you, for our homebound, our shut-ins, for our missionaries throughout the church, but especially for Adam and David and Dale, and those we now name in our hearts. Give them courage to stand firm in their afflictions and patience until the day of your deliverance. Preserve us from pestilence and every evil. Give to us favorable weather and cause the fruits of the earth to prosper, that we may enjoy them in due season and offer you praise and thanksgiving for all your goodness to us. Lend your blessing to all honorable vocations and honest industry that we may serve where our skills and abilities may be of good use. Bless the arts and music, that we may please you and be encouraged by all that is good, right, true, and beautiful. Give to all husbands and wives grace to live together in love and faithfulness. Bless the homes and families of your people, that they may be places where your name is honored and love is nurtured. Give your special grace to the widowed, the orphan, all mothers with child, the aged, and the infirm, that we may grant them comfort, aid, and protection. All these things for which you would have us ask of you, we pray you to grant to us for the sake of the bitter sufferings and death of Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we are bold to call you Father and in whose name we pray trusting in your mercy and confident that you will give answer to our prayers. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated for a moment as the altar is prepared for the service of the sacrament. And once again, I remind you as I'm preparing that we will have the service of the sacrament by continuous flows we've been doing for the last couple of weeks. And hopefully that'll end sooner rather than later. But we are eating and drinking, and that is the important thing when it comes to the sacrament. So rejoice in that, that we are at least able to be here and gather. So again, we'll do one half of the church at a time. And... The ushers will bring you up, and I'll have the elders assisting me. And if you want the chalice, that's fine. Finish what's in the chalice, and as you, uh, uh, the elder will assist in cleaning the chalice. I have two chalices up here, as you see. And the elder will assist, uh, who is, are assisting me, will clean the chalice after each use. But if you would like the chalice, uh, it's here. And this little rag that I have here is soaked with uh, 
um, consumable alcohol, we'll say it like that, that is, uh, will act as a uh, uh, antiseptic if we need it. With that, I invite you to please rise for the service of the sacraments. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who out of love for his fallen creation humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please rise. This most precious body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy words. Thine eyes which salvation which thou hast prepared be he for the face of all people. Of the Thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Please be seated for your hymn to depart, hymn number 865.
Just a few announcements to share with you this morning. Uh, the state of Illinois has moved into phase four, uh, which means we can gather uh, together still in smaller groups than maybe what we're used to. Um, so you can actually now come, you still have to wear your face mask, but you can come to Bible study on Sunday morning, either at 8 o'clock or, or 10.30, but you're also still free to watch those online. I'm going to continue to Zoom both of those. Um, so don't worry about that. If you don't want to stay for that and you're not comfortable with that, that's fine. Uh, we still want to be careful if you're paying attention to the news, and there's a couple of different reasons for this. Uh, there's been you know, increased spikes in places like Texas and uh, Florida, uh, which is not unexpected because they opened earlier, and, and, uh, 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 but it, uh, it seems to be going after now younger people, so we don't know if the disease has mutated. Don't know. Um, anyway, uh, so we're going to, you know, out of love for our neighbor, take things slow and easy. It's nice that we can gather together and um, uh, the way we have been. It's really nice for me. I don't have to just look at the camera. Uh, and anyway, uh, also with that, um, we'll be discussing with St. Matthews about resuming the uh, Tuesday morning Bible study in person for those that'll be up at St. Matthews. They're not going to open until, in some fashion, until next weekend. And uh, we'll talk to them about that. About, but again, that'll also be offered by Zoom, so don't worry if, you, if you'd like to participate by that at home. Uh, the Wednesday night Bible study will be coming to an end for the season this coming Wednesday. It'll be our last class until uh, uh, we approach the fall. And then looking ahead, um, we had, before all this all began, a, a convocation, a circuit convocation. You might remember me talking about that plan, and we were going to host that back um, about, uh, you know, the future of the churches within, in this area with the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, uh, uh, this has taken its toll on a number of churches, particularly some of the ones that are smaller than ours. And, you know, as we look forward, what do we do? How do we think about combining with other churches? How do we share pastors, things like that, if we even need to begin to have those discussions? And it's always good to have those discussions sooner rather than later. Uh, but uh, anyway, that is now planned again for November. All right, so uh, hopefully we'll be past all this, at least reasonably so, by November. But... I'm not in charge of any of that. God is. So uh, with that, um, one final thing. You notice in your bulletin, there is the very last page, uh, uh, the, the formal posting of, of Marty's replacement. Call me. Uh, and probably the best way to get a hold of me, if you're interested in uh, uh, meeting with me and interviewing for that position, call me, and we'll set up a time to do that. Uh, uh, it'll be myself and uh, one of the elders that will do that. Um, and we'll just have a list of questions and nothing. Don't worry, it's not going to be dramatic uh, unless you want it to be. I suppose we can make it dramatic. But, the, uh, uh, but anyway, take a look at that. If you're interested, let me know. And I've already had a couple of people submit some information and stuff like that, which is good because Marty's going to be retiring soon. We're going to plan, hopefully, be able to have a, some sort of good send-off for her. She's been a secretary for uh, half a century. Which is, which is amazing. Uh, it's an, an amazing accomplishment. With that, have a blessed day in the Lord, and I pray you stay well.